Part of uh, what it means to be a human being is to live along a variety of continuums. Each of us vary and differ across all kinds of dimensions. For example, there's an intelligence continuum. Some folks are brilliant beyond imagination where others struggle with basic tasks. Some people are naturally adept at anything that has to do with a ball, whereas if you toss a ball to other people, they will simply stand there and let it hit them, not knowing what to do. There are continuums of tall and short, balding versus Don King, virtuoso versus the sounds of fingernails on a chalkboard, masculine, feminine, just to name a few. But then there's another continuum, and that is the continuum of being an idealist or a pragmatist and something in between. Some of us here today may look at everything in black and white building block kinds of ways, whereas others of us spend our lives hoping for, dreaming for something better. Now I know in my own life, I tend to be somewhat idealistic. It started when I was just a young boy. I remember as a boy, I hoped that those friends that I made when I was five years old would be my friends now so many decades later. As a young minister decades ago, I hoped that every faith community I served would be a haven of compassion and no one would ever say an unkind thing to another. Post 9-11, I hoped that our country would remain unified, even dignified. And for now, as someone who 60 is just a couple years away, I guess I have gotten into some other idealistic hopes, which I will not share. And over time, I've come to realize that there can be a problem with being too idealistic. Idealism can blind you, or at least me, from taking an honest look at things and how things really are. But that said, when it comes to our country, my idealism is gone. Which is not a bad thing, because it's caused me to take a hard look at what it means to follow Jesus in concrete ways in an angry and divisive culture. There is little doubt we are living in a time filled with immense challenges in virtually every area of our society. Little is easy, much is arduous, levels of conflict and hostility are extreme, and like the terribly dry conditions in the Rocky Mountains right now, it feels as if things might just explode. A lot of people are writing about this. One person writes, Outing has become a typical culture war tactic. We take someone who has a different thought or conviction than we do and we declare them anathema. We cut them off. Then we chop off anyone who likes that person well. They also have to be cleaved. And the result is an insulated group of people sitting in an isolated echo chamber where conservatives become more conservative and liberals become liberal, more liberal, and no one has permission to think for themselves. In the spirit of our times, it's why another person writes a conflict is raging and the spoils are the rights to control and shape our nation and policies. Unlike traditional, traditional military conflicts, however, these skirmishes produce no physical casualties, but instead often result in the deaths of characters and reputations. Want to blow up any room in America today? Start talking about any issue. The environment, NAFTA, the wall, poverty, wealth, the Supreme Court, gay marriage, Democrats, Republicans, the media, just about any topic, including religion. And maybe this is why a recent survey showed that 51% of people in America now purposely tailgate others because they're so ticked off. Or while nearly as many yell at other drivers, nearly 50%, or honk at each other. Do you know people actually are starting to honk in Somas Village? What is that? We don't even have a stoplight. <laughs> Do what's worst of all? It's Christians are fighting with each other. And people who don't know Christ are not giving Christ a chance because of our fighting. 
We fight against each other, one person writes, with unrivaled tenacity. Christians on the left villainize conservatives on the right is narrow-minded, antiquated, and uncompassionate. Christians on the right demonize, demonize, I say Christians on the left villainize, yes, Christians on the right demonize believers on the left as unorthodox, comp compromising, and unpatriotic. Christians have joined and even facilitated our culture of coarseness. Christians, sadly, in America are now known primarily for what they fight for. Another person writes, many Christians in America are seeking a domesticated savior, one whose message is easy to swallow and easier to live by. Their Jesus hates the same people they hate. Their Jesus votes like they vote. And their Jesus does not make the nagging demands of the gospel on them. Now I need to be very clear, as citizens of our country in this valley and wherever we call home, we are called to get engaged. We are called to vote. We are called to believe in things. We are called to care about what is happening now and in the future. But the problem is that Christians, as Christians, we need to be careful not to let culture, partisanship, or issues define our faith, but rather Jesus. Jesus needs to be the driver of our lives more than any partisan perspective. As one person notes, the question is not should Christians be involved, but rather how should Christians engage? And what is interesting about all of that I said thus far is it's interesting how things don't really seem to change. Do you know that when Jesus was engaged in his ministry, people at the time were looking for a Messiah, actually a conqueror, who held their views? believed the way they did, and had the same definition of who the real enemy was. The religious people at the time of Jesus was looking for their Messiah to lead them to a political victory and the reestablishment of power in the proper hands. One scholar notes in reading the Gospels, Jesus seems almost unconcerned with political engagement. Sure, his teaching had political implications, but he was not interested in organizing a constituency to fight political battles. Rather, he was focused on what he was called to do, which was to demonstrate that God is love, to heal, to bring about justice, confront the most misdirected religious folks, to forgive, to offer a path forward, and to initiate the kingdom of God. Now, on all of this, I noted this week in our weekly e-letter that one person wrote the following. He states, as Christians, if we're going to survive, if we're meant to be, if we're going to be for the world as Christ meant for us to be for the world, we need to start spending a lot more time away from the world. Isn't that interesting? The suggestion is that we spend a lot more time away from the world. In other words, disengage. Now, while I disagree with this point, I'm not going to question this writer's faithfulness. While I disagree with this point, I'm not going to label him. I'm not going to question his integrity. And just because I disagree with this one point doesn't mean I won't read many other things he writes. But what I will say is that I do not believe as Jesus followers we are called to retreat from our culture and get away from our culture, but rather we are called to do precisely the opposite. I'd like for all of us to think about the fact that each of us here today has a massive opportunity. We are at a perfect nexus point in history in which we can change life by life by life by life. We are at a perfect nexus point in history in which we can join Jesus in a Jesus movement of building the kingdom of God wherever it is that we find ourselves. We are called, I believe, all of us, to shift our energy away from anger, away from divisive engagement, and do what Jesus' disciples, first disciples, did. What did they do? They followed him. They let go of many ways of being and thinking and acting. They let go, and they followed Jesus out into the world. And we too are called to follow, 
to be Jesus' loving, passionate, compassionate presence wherever we find ourselves. We are called, in fact, to focus on Jesus so much, each of us, that it transforms who we are from the inside out. I love what one person writes. He says, Jesus said, follow me, and then he set out on a living lecture to illustrate to us what following him looked like. So given all of this and the fact that I believe we have an immense opportunity to be difference makers, I begin this week with a question that I will speak a little bit more on today, but I'm going to continue next week. The question that I pose that I've been thinking about is, how on earth do we follow Jesus in the midst of so much anger, divisiveness, and vitriol? How do we do it? Well, first a quick point. I know that many of us are tired and exhausted by the anger and divisiveness and violence that surrounds us. I, 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 I'm tired too. I get the need to find spaces to retreat from all of the yelling and hostility. I, I understand the need to have quiet places to take some time away during each day. In the midst of our lives, we are all so busy, the last thing we want to do is take something else on. But taking something else on is not what I'm preaching about. Rather, what I'm talking about is an encouraging invitation to all of us to continue and to work hard at beginning to see things and engage, engage with others in a new way that brings about peace, a sense of purpose, calm, and relief. And while following Jesus is hard, hard work, it releases us to be who we really are, and that's a great thing because that is a relief. So for my remaining few minutes this morning, let's begin, which I'll continue next week, looking at some things to keep in mind when it comes to following Jesus. There's a great pastor and preacher in the last century named A.W. Tozer. Astonishing. You may have heard what he wrote, but if you have or haven't, listen to what he wrote. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are not of one accord by being tuned, they are of one accord, excuse me, they are of one accord by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers met together, each one looking to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God and instead strive for closer fellowship. Said another way, our goal and my goal at the chapel is not to seek unity. It's just not. Rather, the goal for us is to focus so much on Jesus that we become unified because of that focus. Our unity needs to be around Christ, not issues, not party affiliation, not opinions, not partisanship. Often in marriages, I'll use the image of a triangle Picture two people who are very different from one another on edges of the triangle. Imagine two very different people. They disagree just about everything. They're about as far away as they can possibly be. But the third point is Christ. And the, each, the more that each one not looks to the other and what's going on here, but the more each one looks at Christ and moves closer to Christ, look what happens to the distance between them. For each of us to follow Jesus, to make a difference as the body of Christ, we must have unity, unity around Christ. Said another way, Jesus needs to be our focus, not where we happen to be on any particular issue or happen to align ourselves with being conservative or liberal. It's irrelevant. Now, you may have heard me say before, but I'm going to say it again. My vision, my hope, my dream, which I don't believe is idealistic, is that when any of us see a pew full of people 
that we will see a right-wing Republican sitting next to a left-wing liberal sitting next to a migrant, next to the one who wishes to deport everybody that doesn't look like him, next to an old man, next to a team with blue hair, next to you fill in the blanks. Do you know why that's the vision? Because that's what the kingdom of God looks like. A very, group of very different people that are passionate about very different things, yet unified around Jesus, with other differences actually ending up meaning very little. When looking for a church, or when you're thinking about your own church, it breaks my heart because everybody, it's not everybody, but churches have people who do this, don't think about whether the church is liberal or conservative or where it stands on this issue or that. Rather, take a look at how focused the church is on Jesus more than anything else, for such a place will have unity full of people that are going out making a difference despite their individual differences. Such a place will be like a hundred pianos, all tuned to the same floor. And I'll close with this. Well, next week, I'm going to get into some specific concrete things to act upon as we follow Jesus in this angry and divisive culture. I want to wrap up with paraphrasing Bishop Michael Curry. I touched on this subject last week. I guess I have to touch on it every week. But in paraphrased and very slightly adapted form so I could put it together for this, here's what... Michael once said in a sermon that I heard preach. He says, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is self-centeredness and selfishness. The opposite of love is putting me at the center. Said another way, the opposite of love is sin. Sin is when I put me at the center of my life instead of God. This is why Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, all of your strength, all of your soul. And if you love God with all, if I likewise love you all by what I do, then there's not much room left for self-centeredness or selfishness. And when I love you and when I love God, I end up loving me too. Love is how we follow Jesus. It's not pablum. It's the hard work of love is how we follow Jesus. Love is the standard by which to discern truth, not party platform. Love. And if something is not about loving God or loving a neighbor, it is not of God. God is love. To follow Jesus means to love your addicted neighbor, love the, the atheist, love the person who is immersed in Fox News, love the person who watches MSNBC all day, love the liberal, love the conservative, love the person with whom you fundamentally disagree, love the person who frustrates the hell out of you, love because that's the way the kingdom of God looks like it. All of us here today, regardless of our views or opinions, are children of God. Like it or not. Love God, love people. That's how we follow Jesus. It's that straightforward and it's that hard. It's the hardest work there is. As hard and tough as the wood on the cross. These are immensely challenging times in America. But then again, they also were at the time of Jesus. People were occupied by a foreign army. I mean, it was a mess. Yet in the midst of that mess during the time of Jesus, everyone around Jesus was given an astonishing gift. They were given the opportunity to keep their eyes on Jesus, to follow Jesus, to make a massive difference in the lives of everyone they encountered. And what's interesting about the gift that was given to the people around Jesus is you and I have been given that gift today, right now, the exact same gift. We have a massive opportunity to follow Jesus and to change lives and to let go of so much else. I want to assure you of one thing. The more you follow Jesus, the more you let other things go, the more you will find yourself feeling very different from a lot of people around you. The more you follow Jesus, the more you let things go, the more you don't engage in the anger and the violence and all of that stuff, 
the more you will find yourselves feeling not only different, but sometimes quite alone and isolated. But then again, I have to ask the question, how else would we rather spend our lives than following the one who gave us life to begin with?